Um, so, uh, like uh, Petra introduced, my name is Uma Ramadas. I am a Indian woman. I'm based out of Atlanta, Georgia, in the United States. I am today speaking from my office. I'm wearing a floral printed uh, black blouse and a black jacket. And I am a, a solutions architect specialist on integration services. My primary job is to work with customers guide them on best practices on the services that I am I build expertise. As you would have noticed, I am a newbie here and um, you know uh, what am I doing? I was introduced to Airflow only last year. In the beginning, I wanted to understand how it is different from step functions. And but then soon I realized there is more to Airflow than just understanding the difference that 25,000 stars in GitHub is, 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 is more, right? It, there is something to it. So I started from the basics. In these days, I talk to many customers who are, you know, many of them are in the early stage of adopting Airflow. But, you know, sometimes they are a little, you know, little, you know, rushing to get to production. So I wanted to use this opportunity to talk to you and mainly customers who are in the early stage of adoption on building resilient pipelines. So my talk is well architectural workflows, uh, specifically on building resilient pipelines. So what is resiliency? Right, it is the ability to recover from failures. Right, you have a critical dashboard, and you found that the source data for the dashboard is skewed. When would, will you find out? Will you find out during the pipeline? Will you find out after it is uh, the dashboard is messed up? Messed up. So, the the functionality or like the ability to recover from failures is mainly the resiliency, but um, how do I define a resilient workflows, right? Resilient workflows consist of tasks which are atomic, which are designed with single responsibility. They can be retried automatically to solve transient errors. The entire workflow and also the um, task is redrivable. What I mean by redrivable is they can be redone many times and without any side effects. So I define a resilient workflow as redrivable workflows with retriable atomic task. But building and running resilient workflows is not just one single thing. It has got many steps into it. And we start with building, you solve a problem by building a pipeline and you deploy it. A lot of times there may be some issue, right? Something's going to fail. And like Werner Vogel said, actually everything fails all the time. Um, Werner Vogel is the CTO of Amazon.com. So what makes your pipeline successful is how you recover. You design your system or your pipeline so it can fail safe and fail fast, right? After recovering from your failure, the first thing you're going to do is to analyze the cause of failure. That is going to be the most uncomfortable conversation you're going to have. You're going to look inside, your, inside you and your team to find out what happened, right? Once you find the root cause, you are going to make some changes. And that change could be a change in change in operational practices, or it could be the team change, or it could be a technology. But there is certainly need to be some change. If there is no change and you discard it, like, oh, there's is one time problems. Um, there's this is just one person who did it. I fired him. Then you're doing something wrong, right? So this is a cycle, you need to close the cycle. I'm not going to talk through the entire cycle because it's going to take a long time. I already wasted at one minute there. And my talk is, um, is just 25 minutes. So I'm going to focus mainly on the build phase of the pipeline. So before I start, right? We, I want you to understand how resiliency is built into the Airflow architecture itself, right? We all know Airflow has several moving parts. It's truly a distributed architecture. 
you can display, deploy everything in here in one single machine and get it running. It works very well for local development, sometimes like in the early stages of data pipelines, but more often you will come up with something like this, a production suitable implementation like this, incorporating many of the best practices, right? That's out there in the community. Airflow V2 architecture offers you high availability with multiple schedulers that removes the single point of failure concerns. Scheduler comes up with a component called executor, which you can extend it, bring your own executor like Celery, Kubernetes, or a combination of two, where you can even run multiple um, tasks in parallel. And depending on the architecture or the technology you're using, you could have auto-scaled workers. It gives you the scalability that you need. Executors and the workers are typically decoupled through a messaging queue. We all know messaging queues offers buffering. It gives you the reliability through variable scaling and fault tolerance. So schedulers and workers can scale differently. You can choose a file system such as an object storage like um, Google Cloud Storage or Amazon S3. They offer high availability. You can also design in such a way that data from the, your workflows from these object storage be synced with your schedulers and the workers periodically for faster and reliable access. Typically, you would be using a relational database like Postgres. If you're using Post, Postgres, you can improve connection pooling by using a service like a PG Bouncer, or if you're in AWS, use RDS proxy. You can have multiple web servers deployed in a load balanced environment. The entire architecture can be extended to fit in or bring your own authentication and authorization tools and also observability tools. Having these architectural choices and making these architectural choices are critical and necessary for your environment, but that's not enough. Your DAG has to be designed resilient to perform the intended function correctly and consistently. So the first design principle I'm bringing in is all or none atomicity. The operations in your task are done when it is success and they are none of it is done when it is a failure. There is no intermediary state. Why do we really need it, right? Consider an example where you process a document, maybe multiple documents. The processing includes extracting metadata or data from different places and then extracting metadata, storing that metadata and processing the file by different pipe, by the file type. You could write everything in a bash uh, script and run in a bash operator. It's very powerful, very tempting. I would ask the question, is it the right choice? And if you are migrating from a platform like Jenkins to Airflow, maybe it's a quicker way to do it, but you don't get any benefits out of it, right? So consider the, this example, where, what is wrong with it? What happens if the failure happens in the uh, processing of the file? What happens you're adding new files and each of them have to be um, processed differently. This design is neither atomic nor extensible. So what do we do? How do we make it atomic? Think about single responsibility design. With simple design changes like here, just write down your task logically, you add all the goodness granular failure handling, maintainability, extensibility. It's easy, right? But sometimes you have to be careful when you design tasks with single responsibility model. Now consider the last task, update external API. Typical API calls require you to obtain a API key and then call the API. 
So you attempted to split it into two, di two different tasks because you're thinking about single responsibility. But what happens if the update API fails? So you're getting the API key, storing it in XCOM maybe, and that's how we are sharing it with the update API and update API fails uh, permanently, not transient error. So either client side error or the server side error, you fix it and you're rerunning the task. If the API key expires, you're getting an unexpected behavior. So even though this seems to be two different tasks, they are part of a single operation, so they are better together. Our next design principle is making failures safe. Well, I have retries, isn't that enough? Well, retries can cause problems. They can cause side effects if the system is not designed with item potency in mind. So item potency is basically implies the outcome of your task or your workflow is the same regardless of how many times you run with the same input. So let's run through a quick example. You are doing data aggregation in the pipeline and then you're storing the data in the database. You made some changes in your pipeline and rerunning your pipeline. What happens if you have insert statement in the store database? You're going to either have duplicate records or if you design your table with primary key constraints, you're going to have a constraint error. So the operation is not item pertinent. How do you correct it? Let's look at some techniques. You can start with absurd. If the database supports it, really good technique. If the database does not support it, you might want to check the community provider operators. For example, Redshift does not support absurd. It's one of the popular databases used with the Airflow. If you have to do it yourself, you have to create a staging table, merge the data, you know, load the data and merge the data with the destination table and delete the stage ta staging table. It's a lot of code, a lot of things that you have to do, right? And that's what you have to do if you don't have anything and you need item potency. So rather the Redshift operator provides you a single parameter that you can do, method equal to absurd and everything else taken care inside that operator. Isn't it nice? You really don't have to do anything at all. Sometimes doing absurd may be a costly operation because you have just a single record, right? So you can just validate the existence of the record before you know, inserting it into the table. Let's take another example. In this example, you really do not have control over the operation. It's not your change. You're calling an external API. It could be an email service. It could be another API. You really don't know whether it is designed with item potency. So now when, what happens when you rerun your pipelines? You're gonna have unexpected behaviors. You really don't know. So you might wanna ask a few questions. Is it okay if the client, if, it, like in the case of email service, it receive multiple emails. How often this can happen? So depending on that, you might want to design a state aware task, a task that can store the state of whether the in transaction or the API is called. And before calling the API, it checks the state. You know, it could be an item potent key, in a, in a key, an item potent key, or it could be the, ta uh, the run ID itself, and you store it and you check whether the API is called. Our next design principle is about protecting the downstreams. I have a couple of threads. I actually have three tips here. First one is retries. When a client retries, it spends most of the server's time to get a higher chance of success, right? So when failures are rare or transient, that's not a problem. When failures are caused by overload, retries are going to 
make things much more worse. So the preferred mechanism is to use, is, is like back off, right? Instead of retrying immediately and aggressively, your client is going to wait for some time between the retries. Like we see in the, in the slide, retry delay introduces certain delays. And you could have it in the task argument, or it could, it could, it could be in the task, or it could be in the uh, DAG default arguments. Another common pattern is adding some kind of a jitter with it. So retry exponential back off basically adds some jitter, another um, uh, amount of time delay based on what, what, uh, what, what is the retry number. So on the right side of the um, slide, you will see how exponential back, back off is going to reduce the number of calls that's going to go to the uh, downstream. The next tip is max active runs. Why is it relevant? Where is it relevant? Catch up and backfills are the two common workflows we've all tried, right? They both are used to run the DAG for the past dates, but with nuanced details. In the diagram on the left, you see those orange circles. They are like milestones, I would call them, like DAG start date or current date. And the smaller ones, the oval ones, are the executions. The gray one is an execution that is not run. And maybe the DAG was passed. When the DAG is unpassed, let's say today, those gray ones starts running. So catch up will start run all the missed executions up to the start date. And when you run backfill, when you run backfill, it's going to rerun your executions. You, you will have a change in logic and you want to backfill for the for the past two weeks. And it's going to rerun all your executions for the past two weeks. You could have a start date before your DAG start date. They are really useful, very powerful features, but they can be dangerous because like you see on the right side, they're going to have multiple concurrent DAG runs based on max active runs. So if you're downstream, is cannot handle or cannot handle this many number of calls, you're going to get into a problem. It's going to be a toast. So the max active run setting can be uh, set at the DAG level. And there are other parameters as well in uh, with respect to doing backup and catch, um, uh, back, catch up and backfill. Um, check, those, check those out. And the max active runs is per single DAG. How about across the DAGs? I'm sure you've used pools. I call them preemptive load shedding because it is different. It's client-side load shedding than the usual load shedding mechanisms that are applied at the server side, like throttling, right? So with pools, you create a pool and have a size for the pool and then assign your task into the pool and assign arbitrary task to the pool. So the tasks that are assigned and they are scheduled, they go into the queued state and they go into the run state. So if the pool size is reached, they will be queued and they will not be running. So this will be great technique to protect your low scaling downstream systems, like you know legacy databases or mainframes. Similar to any load shedding techniques, which offer some sort of prior priority mechanisms to prioritize client requests, pools also has priority queue. Our next design principle is, um, is about failing fast and failing forward. If something is going to fail, we want this to happen as soon as possible because we don't want to waste time. We don't want to waste money. It's good to know that something is failed, but isn't it better if you know something is about to fail? SLAs, service level agreements. It is an expectation for the maximum time a task should take. If a, ta if a, if a task takes longer than this to run, right? 
it will get into the SLA miss, misses dashboard. You can also set SLA miss callback. You can set SLA at the DAG level. You can set SLA at the task level. But SLA is not going to cancel your task or fail your task. Sometimes you really don't want to run this task after a certain period of time. You want this, you want it to fail, fail fast, right? So you can set execution timeout on the task level. And once your task reaches the timeout, it will the task will fail. Sometimes you may want to treat failures as acceptable series of events. You, so you can take a alternate route. For example, you have like token expired or foo is not equal to bar. You know these are obvious errors. Then raise exceptions, airflow skip exceptions or airflow fail exceptions. And then based on the exceptions, right, you can skip or fail, you trigger alternate route. Maybe take the data from somewhere else, right? Or maybe, um, you know, fail gracefully. And another important thing when you're building big data pipelines is checkpointing, validating your data before you realize your customer is built twice, right? There is an excellent um, resource um, to find out more about the libraries and how you can do it. And I'm going to share that towards the end of the session. So on the resiliency design principles, um, let me do a quick recap. We talked through how you can break down your pipeline process, the task, atomically, so as to make sure the operation is either done successfully or there is no intermediary state hanging on. Secondly, we talked through how you can make failure safe by thinking item potently. And third thing, we, we, we shared some tips on how you can protect a low scaling downstream system. Lastly, we went through some fail fast and fail forward mechanisms to recover from failures quickly. There are tons of best practices in the community. Right? Sam and Megan from Shopify did an excellent talk on day one. John Jackson did a, a wonderful talk on Tuesday on in running Airflow at scale. But I'm going to go over a few. Maybe something that you have gone through already. So the first and foremost is using Airflow as an orchestration tool, not actually running your business logic or data pro data processing code. Why not, right? As a Airflow developer, I don't have to know about Docker. I don't have to know about Kubernetes. There is a compute available. I could just run the compute, easy, right? Why not? Why can't we do it? Airflow compute is selected for the general purpose DAG orchestrations. Your business logic and the computation might require a CPU tuned, memory tuned, a purpose built environment. You might be doing machine learning, require a SageMaker or some other tool. You really don't have to write everything because the community offers you tons of operators. Like we, we saw the Redshift operator, you, you, it avoids lots of boilerplate code that you have to do. So leverage that and use Airflow as an orchestration tool. As you continuously develop and deploy, there are lots of rooms for bugs and issues, right? Isn't it better you have a startup feedback loop so you can fix them and you know you can deploy them before you, you know, move it to production or non-production environment. You can deploy Airflow image in your local development, write some unit test, make sure you're confident about your DAG, and then move it to source control where you are collaborating with the rest of your teams. It's just not your workflows. You have other workflows as well. Now, all of them have to work together to perform everything consistently and correctly. Right? So then you, re you need a continuous integration, continuous deployment pipeline. 
And in that pipeline, while you're building, you could, you could run testing before you do that. And your testing can do several things. At least it's sanity testing, unit testing on your custom operators, some branching logics you have, decision trees. That is absolutely must. And you may also want to check the parse times, uh, you know, what's the DAG bag import times, all of those before you figure out this is all um, messing up your DAG in your production. Right? And the whole thing can be extended so that your CA CD process provisions your environment and updates your environment when necessary. Leah Cole talked about um, Happy DAG. I think that the title was Happy DAG, um, Happy Team. Um, it was on Tuesday, really a very good talk and she had an awesome demo as well. If you haven't checked out, please check it out. And the last thing I'm gonna stop right here is how you monitor your workflows. Building is not enough. It's definitely not enough. You have to constantly monitor what is going on. You have to review your metrics, operational metrics with your team every week. I have listed here some metrics. There are just a few because your DAGs are different. Some DAGs are critical, some DAGs are not. So you have to come up with what is important for your business, build a dashboard and a reliable notification mechanisms to be alerted when thresholds exceeds. Some of them can be built in the CACD process like the, process, the, the parse time or the DAG bag import proactively, right? And you can also leverage dashboards like landing times or gun chart um, to troubleshoot performance issues. All right, so this is, I've come to the end of my presentation, but I'm going to share some resources I found extremely helpful when I started learning. So I, I hope those will help you as well. So keep your phone ready to capture those QR codes. First one is testing in Airflow. If you want to learn more about how you do testing and how you automate testing, this is a great article written by Chandu Kabar. Check that out. And the next thing is um, on data validation and checkpointing, checking quality of your uh, data. This is a astronomer um, video, a really awesome video. Um, you know, it has an associated GitHub repo as well. Um, if you get a chance, please check that out as well. And the third is Airflow best practices. I don't know if you have got a chance to check it out late, uh, lately. I've done it. It was really awesome. Lots of new information there, starting with uh, DAG, uh, you know, top level code to, you know, DAG loaded test and, um, and then like performance tuning, etc. So really awesome resource. Check that out as well. I know I haven't left any time for Q&A, but I am available. Uh, I'll check back again, uh, log into StreamYard and answer your questions there. And thank you so much. Thank you um, very much for the opportunity.